Yeah, uh, I think I'd like to uh, start by thanking our host, uh, UNIST, uh, for organizing this uh, wonderful event and for their uh, hospitality, uh, for which I'm sure many of you uh, share the appreciation. And um, it's a great privilege uh, to speak here in honor of uh, Professor Yao. Uh, I was uh, his uh, graduate students and have been his uh, uh, collaborators uh, for the past 20 years. So uh, it's a pleasure to speak about our uh, recent joint work. Um, so this is about angular momentum uh, in general relativity. Um, so I'd like to start with a, uh, with a video. Okay. So you can see that this is actually the uh, uh, simulation of the first detection of gravitational wave. And you can see two black balls in the center. Um, they, actually, um, they, they, well, they actually correspond to two black holes. And you can see one is slightly larger uh, than the other, and they're actually rotating uh, about each other. And at the end, uh, they merge into a single black hole that is uh, uh, rotating. Okay. So as I said, this is a first um, detection, a simulation of the first detection of, uh, of, of gravitational wave. And, um, and this is an event that is called GW, so gravitational wave uh, 15. So it happened in 2015 and uh, September uh, 14. And it actually correspond to a binary black hole merger. And let me just use, uh, use this uh, picture here uh, to depict what happened. So again, you see two black holes. Uh, they're rotating about each other. But we, uh, as, uh, as distant observers, so we're actually looking here. So uh, while in usually when we depict picture in general relativity, this is the direction of time, okay? So we are actually, so these eyes will correspond to, um, to distant observers such as ourselves. So we're looking at this uh, uh, system and we are actually uh, situated at this so-called uh, future now infinity. So this is uh, denoted as uh, uh, scribe plus. So think about you have uh, a binary black hole system here and they just uh, move uh, along time, uh, south from two, rotating about each other and eventually uh, move into a single uh, rotating black hole. And we as, uh, uh, as observers, you know, at this boundary here and we're looking at this system and the question is, uh, what is the angular momentum um, of, uh, of this uh, system? Okay. So um, here, um, so you can see idealized distant observer is situated by uh, future now infinity. So I'll talk about this. This is so-called scribe plus uh, future now infinity. And um, uh, we want to understand uh, or try to define uh, angular momentum uh, as scribe plus. And this is based on joint work uh, with Pauline Chen, Jordan Keller, uh, Daniel Perezo, Robert Ward, Yi Kai Wang, and Professor Yao. Okay, and what is the criterion of a good definition? So you look at this, uh, uh, these two black holes that are rotating, so there must be an angular momentum. And at the end, uh, they merge into a single rotating black hole. There should be another angular momentum. And I'd like to propose uh, two um, uh, criterion. So first of all, um, it should be well-defined. I mean, we're mathematicians, right? We want to make sure that it's well-defined, independent of uh, observers. So you may have uh, different observers looking at the system here, but when you talk about angular momentum, it should be uh, a concept that is independent of, uh, of whichever uh, observer is. And secondly, uh, we want it to be stably defined. In the sense that, well, imagine uh, well, one day uh, when we can really um, observe this, and then uh, whenever you're doing observation, doing experiment, you have to allow errors, okay? So the definition has to be uh, stable, okay? Whenever you perturb it a little bit, uh, you should still uh, get an answer that is within uh, the expected error, okay? And uh, of course, when you talk about um, this, you look at this uh, physical system here, you try to define angular momentum, you have to choose a, a coordinate um, to describe it. So in this talk, I'll discuss these uh, issues, okay, uh, in the so-called boundary sex uh, coordinate system. So this has been developed since the uh, 1960s. But uh, the issue of these, uh, they are actually universal. 
uh, independent of uh, any kind of description of, uh, of null infinity that you have. Okay, uh, so let's just start from a very simple uh, space time, uh, that is the Minkowski space time. Okay, so that is the space time of special relativity. Um, well, well, let's just use a um, well, you know, the usual coordinate system, so T, X, Y, and Z. In this case, of course, uh, the space time metric, uh, which of course, that's uh, uh, what is gravitational field here. Uh, it's just uh, minus TT squared plus DX squared plus DY squared plus DZ squared. But since we're interested uh, in future now infinity, okay, so we're interested in uh, how you know the signal propagated in the uh, uh, in in the direction of light. So what we do is we can just uh, uh, com well we can actually first convert it to polar co uh, spherical coordinates. So we take r is equal to square root of s square plus y square plus z square as you do uh, in multivariable calculus. And then a very important uh, coordinate change is the so-called retarded time. Okay, it's called retarded time because it's t minus this r here. Okay. And you can see that this, uh, uh, this uh, well, after this coordinate change here, uh, you can actually turn this metric here uh, into this form. Okay, where this uh, uh, sigma a b here, uh, here I'm actually, uh, well, I'm actually hiding the uh, this spherical coordinates theta phi here, uh, so this x a here. But this part here is really just a standard uh, round metric on a unit sphere. Okay. And because we're interested in infinity, okay, in this uh, uh, now infinity, so we imagine you have an isolated system and we're just trying to uh, observe the system from, from very far away, uh, okay? So uh, what we're gonna do is uh, uh, we're going to uh, look at uh, when R is equal to infinity. And now there's actually this uh, trick here uh, that is called the uh, conformal compatibilization, okay? Uh, so we can choose a different coordinate system. Uh, let's say this rho is equal to one over R here. And then uh, we can rewrite this, uh, um, this coordinate system here. Well, here I'm actually hiding this uh, row here. It's, uh, but you can just use this one here and dealing with R equal to infinity is the same as dealing with a uh, row is equal to zero. But now you can actually turn this Mikowski metric into this metric here. And you can see that this is uh, up to a conformal factor of R squared here. Uh, you actually have uh, this metric. But this metric, uh, when r is equal to infinity, then this term goes away and this term goes away. And uh, at r equal to infinity, it is actually a degenerate metric in a sense that r equal to infinity, uh, you should expect for a three-dimensional metric, but it is degenerate. It's actually a two-dimensional one, okay? And this is actually quite, um, quite important. But uh, with this conformal metric, then you can bring, see what we're interested in is, uh, is this uh, uh, feature now infinity. So you correspond to really uh, just the end of this, uh, this now geodesic there. But we're gonna use uh, a, a conformal compatibilization to bring it to, uh, to a finite part. So this is so-called uh, Penrose uh, conformal, conformal compatibilization. So our whole space time, we actually look at uh, the following, okay? And what we're interested in is this now infinity that will correspond to r equal to infinity here. So this is like a, 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 a lamp shade. You know, look at a lamp, look at a shade. And the boundary of this, uh, this uh, lamp shade uh, is actually uh, your uh, future uh, now infinity. And we are looking uh, inside uh, this, uh, this lamp. This, okay? And it's also this coordinate that u equal to minus infinity that will correspond to a retarded time. Uh, it's this part here, it's the so-called space light infinity, and u equal infinity, uh, that will correspond to the uh, time light infinity. And here we're actually interested in this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, hypersurface, because you remember uh, this u here correspond to t minus r. So uh, their level set will correspond to some kind of 45 degree uh, hypersurface, and that is this, uh, uh, this now hypersurface here. So this is a conformal complication. Um, of actually um, the Mikowski or of uh, Schwarz or space time. Um, basically, any uh, isolated system, uh, as long as your space time is asymptotic flat, um, then you actually get this kind of picture. Okay. And, um, and you can actually write down the uh, coordinate system uh, actually very uh, explicitly because so what you expect, uh, you should be able to read off this information. So, uh, for example, angular momentum uh, from um, the space time metric. And um, that is what the uh, um, that's what was representing the gravitational field. 
So if you look at a general asymptotically flat uh, vacuum space time, I'll just look at the, uh, the simple case. So assume the space time satisfies the Einstein equation, and that is vacuum. And near uh, square plus, uh, we can actually use the so-called uh, bounding sex coordinates um, to describe uh, the space time metric. Okay? And it is asymptotically flat in the following sense. You can see that in this, uh, uh, co well, the coordinates are here, but then we have actually this metric uh, coefficient. Okay, you write down this metric here. So the U and B here, and also this is H, A, B here, and this W, A here. But since we, uh, we are looking at the asymptotic flat space sum, so we expect that when R go to infinity, all these coefficient, uh, we actually approach to the coefficient of the Mikowski space sum. So Mikowski space sum is a flat space sum, and that is our model space sum. So that would transcribe into uh, this asymptotic condition here. Okay. Then what you do is uh, uh, you're, you're, you're basically just solving uh, the, uh, the Einstein equation, okay? And uh, under this uh, this coordinate system here, and in this coordinate system here, uh, you ended up with a six uh, metric coefficient because you're taking advantage of uh, uh, coordinate uh, freedom here. You uh, in, and um, and specifically, you can actually choose uh, this coordinate in the following way. So I'm not going to go over um, every one of them, but the important thing here is that this uh, level sets of u here, you recall in Mikowski case, uh, it's just t minus r. Uh, but in general, you should take one uh, that are actually now hypersurfaces, or actually they satisfy this uh, uh, particular equation. And that will actually give you uh, the vanishing of one of the uh, uh, inverse metric coefficient. And this R uh, coordinate uh, correspond to this uh, uh, area distance. So um, you want to make sure that this, uh, the determinant of this HAB here uh, is actually equal to the determinant of, uh, of a standard wrong metric. Uh, when r is equal to large. So it is under this formal reason, uh, which uh, was developed in the 1960s, uh, bounding sex. Then you can actually go ahead to solve Einstein equation. Okay? And, um, and it turns out you actually have to solve uh, uh, quite a few of o, uh, ODE systems, and they, are, they can actually be solved. And um, just like some of the second order ODE, uh, you want to make some assumption to make sure that you don't have log term. Yeah, and the physics call it uh, no outgoing radiation condition, okay? Uh, but with this condition here, you can actually solve each of the uh, metric coefficient um, in terms of uh, power series is R, uh, R minus one. You call R equal to infinity uh, is, uh, is now infinity. That's where we were interested. In. So it's kind of we're solving uh, from uh, now infinity. So in particular, uh, if you look at the, uh, the expansion of uh, this V here, okay, you recall V is actually here. And if you're familiar with the Schwarzschild space time, and this is where you should read off uh, the mass of the uh, Schwarzschild metric. Uh, but in general case, uh, you can actually uh, expand uh, this V here, uh, but you're gonna get a term here in the one over R term. Uh, this is no longer just a number, uh, like the Schwarzschild case, uh, but it's going to be a function that depends on this u and the, uh, the uh, spherical coordinates or, or the angular coordinates. They're actually uh, theta and phi here. Uh, but uh, Bondi and Sachs, they just propose a definition uh, for the energy momentum uh, and now infinity. So this is really associated with each uh, u slice. Okay? So um, yeah, you recall each u slice will look like this. Okay? So these are uh, now hypersurface. For each one of them, uh, you can define the so-called uh, bounding sex uh, energy momentum by just integrating out uh, the, uh, uh, the spherical variable here. So you integrate against uh, uh, S2. Okay. So you get uh, energy, uh, this E here, associated with each U here, and you also get the uh, linear momentum uh, associated with this U here. And you get, so you get a, a full vector here. And here, uh, this uh, x k tilde here, they're just a restriction of standard coordinate functions of R3 to x2. Or um, they just correspond to this uh, L equal to one uh, spherical harmonics. And um, this well-known um, Bundy energy loss formula tell you that uh, if you actually differentiate uh, this energy here, okay, um, but everything is under the assumption of vacuum Einstein equation. It was so that, that will actually give you the whole uh, system there. Uh, but if you actually um, plug in the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, vacuum Einstein equation, 
um, then um, well, then you're going to see that the right hand side is uh, manifestly uh, negative. Okay, so it's minus a quarter of this NAB squared. And this NAB here, uh, NAB squared, uh, where does it come from? So everything should go back to the, this metric coefficient. So here, if you look at this uh, HAB here, again, you can do uh, the expansion. And the, um, this, uh, um, the next term uh, is going to be CAB here, and this is called a shear. But if you differentiate uh, one more time of this uh, uh, CAB here, which is equal to U, then you get another tensor here. So we are all going to consider, you recall, um, all these uh, metric coefficients, uh, they are going to depend on this U here, but you, they are also going to consider, um, depend on the spherical coordinates. But really, we're just going to consider them um, as uh, geometric quantities on the sphere uh, that depend on, on U, okay? So that's really uh, what the, uh, uh, what the uh, um, feature now infinity look like. I mean, although here, this is like a, a circle but really uh, the dimension is suppressed by one. So it really depend, uh, it really represent a two dimensional sphere. Okay. And this is actually uh, sort of the first uh, theoretical verification of the wave nature uh, of gravitation. Okay. It just tell you that this uh, energy just radiated away uh, along the null direction. Okay. So for example, in, if you look at this, uh, uh, this picture here, you have one now hypersurface, you have another now hypersurface here, then energy can actually radiate away uh, along these, uh, these now directions. Okay. And of course, uh, a very natural question is that what if we actually use a different uh, coordinate system to describe it? Okay. Um, but, and this question uh, is, actually, uh, is actually quite realistic uh, because even uh, in, the, in the case of Mikowski space, okay? Uh, so we have Tx, Y, and Z here, but of course we can translate this uh, coordinate Tx, Y, Z here, and we are going to uh, get a different coordinate system, okay? And uh, in terms of the Tx, Y, Z, uh, Cartesian coordinates, they, they, they look like they're just different by a constant. But once you, um, you look at this uh, retarded time here, um, it actually look quite different. Okay, so even for ordinary translation, so of course you should allow, right? You have one observer here and you can move your observer to another uh, reference point and you look at it. But, uh, but the, uh, this U system here, this bounding sex coordinate system uh, will transform like this. So this is the old U and this is the new U and they are actually related uh, by a function here on a, uh, on a two sphere uh, that actually corresponds to this, uh, um, this uh, uh, L less than or equal to one uh, spherical harmonics. So this is a constant term, and this Xi were just the Xi that I just mentioned, um, the uh, L equal to one spherical harmonics. So you can see that this, uh, this uh, uh, well, I mean, putting in this coordinate system here, um, the ordinary translation um, no longer looked that trivial. And it was a, a discovery of, uh, of uh, um, Bondi and his collaborator uh, in the 1960s. They noticed that, well, you can really just take any function on a two-sphere, any smooth function on a two-sphere. Then you will be able to, um, to find a new coordinate system here, such that this u bar is equal to u plus this function here, plus some lower the term here, and that will give you um, a metric that looks like exactly of the form of bounding sex coordinates just mentioned. Okay, so you can actually accomplish this uh, using any, uh, any fun smooth function on the two dimensional sphere. Okay, if you just use the L less than equal to one, um, then you just get the ordinary translation. Um, but in general, uh, you can get uh, some non-trivial uh, bounding sex coordinate system and they call uh, these uh, super translations, okay? So really, they just uh, they just correspond to a function uh, on the two-dimensional sphere uh, that is of a higher uh, higher mode. And this is actually true for any general asymptotically flat space time. And the real reason, um, well, at least uh, what I, how I understood it is that this uh, future now infinity is actually idealized uh, now hypersurface of this form of S two cross R. And you actually come with a, a degenerate root two metric, okay? Well, so it looks like a cylinder, but the metric is actually degenerate, 
Uh, but once it's uh, degenerate, uh, you will not be able to uh, tell um, a, a general cross section from a level set of U because the induced metric are all going to be a uh, wrong metric. Okay. And for this reason, um, it is known that the asymptotically uh, symmetry group of square plus is not a Poincaré group. Because uh, well, you expect that um, when you go out to infinity of the isolated system, the gravitation field is very, very weak and everything should just go back to Mikowski space time. And the symmetry group uh, should just be the Poincaré group. Uh, but it was this discovery um, back in the 1960s that um, the symmetry group is actually infinite dimensional because it contains um, the group of all smooth functions on S2. And um, so in the space of uh, uh, bounded uh, sex uh, coordinates, it's just like a, a fine space. I mean, there's just no origin there. And one is just as good as the other. Okay? And especially uh, when you have radiation. Okay, so there's no preferred uh, bounded sex coordinate, but you have you know this infinite uh, uh, choice of uh, of uh, bounded sex coordinate system. And when you transform uh, from one bounded sex coordinate to another, all metric coefficient actually uh, change accordingly. Okay, but because of this procedure, you can see that I mean we have asymptotic flat space time, and then uh, we change to another one, and then we look at the uh, metric coefficient. Uh, and now infinity here. So it turns out uh, the transformation law, um, they're actually quite complicated. So for example, the, uh, the mass aspect function uh, changed like, uh, like this, okay. Or involve, uh, you know, if, if you do a super translation like this for general function f here, and uh, it's going to involve the news tensor and also involve higher derivative of f. I mean, all this, uh, uh, this novel will correspond to the uh, novel operator with respect to um, to, uh, to the center uh, round metric. As I said, all these, you should consider them as geometric quantities on, on the center as two, uh, but depend on you. And this uh, uh, CAB here is a shear, and you can see also uh, transform quite, uh, quite complicated, you involve the uh, second derivative, so F. But somehow this, uh, uh, this new tensor uh, actually transform really like a tensor, okay? So you just, uh, well, when your U is equal to U bar plus F of X, you really just plug in. You really just do a, a pullback, just like a tensor here. And therefore, if you come back and you look at this uh, uh, total energy flux, okay? You recall that uh, we, we, we compute that the derivative of U uh, uh, correspond to this part here, of course, with this one here. So you'd be very interested in the total flux. So in the following sense, I mean, if you look at um, future now infinity, right? And you know the energy has been radiated away in this direction. So if you look, start from u equal to minus infinity, right? And then you keep on uh, moving to u equal to infinity, and you measure uh, the amount of energy, um, you know, flow away uh, in this, uh, radiate away in this, uh, in this process. And that will correspond to the, um, to the integral of this from minus infinity to, uh, to infinity. Okay, so you can see this total energy flux is going to be the total integral of this one here. But because uh, the new tensor actually transform like this, so you can do a simple change of variable. And you can see that if you just change from one coordinate system to another coordinate system, they are going to be the same. Okay, and therefore the total energy flux is actually super translation in the, uh, invariant. In the sense that if you change from one bounded sets coordinate, to another one, or you change from one distant observer to another distant observer, you should observe the same amount of, uh, of uh, energy flux. Okay? And therefore, uh, you can say that the total energy radiated away uh, is actually well defined. And if you go back to their um, announcement, so this is the amount that the paper uh, on physical review where uh, I think there are probably like 800 collaborators of this paper. <laughs> the first one is Apple at all. So when they announced the first uh, observation of uh, gravitational wave, and uh, so this is uh, September 14, 2015. Uh, but if you register the abstract, you're gonna see all these numbers, okay? So the initial black hole masses are 36 and 29. And the final black hole mass is 62. So you notice that there's a discrepancy there, okay? And the algebra just work out that 39 
uh, plus uh, uh, 36 plus 29, uh, minus the final mass, the 62. And therefore, you have three units of mass radiated away uh, in gravitational wave. Okay? And this is a number that every observer uh, would, would accept because of this uh, super translation uh, invariance. But you remember, uh, what we're interested in uh, is, is angular momentum, okay? So this uh, uh, video that you show you, we have two black holes that are rotating about each other. So there's, there must be some initial angular momentum and they merge into a single black hole that keep on rotating. Uh, what is the angular momentum flux? Uh, and whether uh, we can talk about uh, super translation invariance or not. Okay, but it turns out um, the definition of angular momentum uh, is much is more subtle. Okay, um, and it actually relies on some higher order expansion of this uh, this W A here. Okay, so let me uh, remind you that. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, this is uh, um, why when, whenever you have an observer, you choose a coordinate system, then you um, you read off the metric coefficient and the mass or the energy uh, can be read off from this V here. But if you want to read off the angular momentum, uh, you should go back to uh, to this WA here. And the reason for that is, uh, well, here I didn't actually mention, there's actually a, a, a model space-time um, in general relativity that is called a care space-time. That's whenever you refer to uh, angular momentum, uh, you, you look at this uh, uh, care space time. And, and that's where uh, the, uh, the, uh, the angular momentum of care space time appear uh, when you write it in this coordinate system. Okay. And um, so it turns out the angular momentum would depend on this uh, uh, higher order expansion of this WA here that appear in your uh, match coefficient. And you actually appear in the higher order. Uh, as you can see, this is a one over R squared term. They involve the divergence of this uh, shear. Um, but they, they don't contain any information about uh, the angular momentum. And to look for angular momentum, you have to go to the one over R cubed term. Okay? And um, when after subtracting uh, these terms of, uh, of the uh, shear, uh, you're going to left with uh, an A here. And as I said, you should really consider this NA here as sort of a one fold. Um, or this one here should be considered as a one fold uh, on uh, uh, the unit sphere uh, that depend on this U here. Okay. So, so when, when you move and you're along you have now infinity, uh, when U is changing, you get a, a U dependent uh, one fold on um, um, uh, S2. But this is a so called uh, angular momentum uh, aspect. And to define angular momentum, uh, you have to evolve this And um, so there are actually a lot of efforts um, to, um, to define uh, angular momentum uh, since the 1960s. And there are actually um, different approaches and different uh, descriptions um, actually to somehow different uh, expressions. So use Hamiltonian or spinner twisters, uh, approach of Penrose and Thoma type. Here. So I'm just, uh, I just have a partial list here of uh, uh, different type of uh, uh, angular momentum uh, that was uh, uh, defined uh, since 1960. And uh, all of it actually covered uh, the care of uh, angular momentum. As I mentioned, this is a, a model space out. So of course, whenever you come up with a definition, you check this curve, it make sure it's consistent. And, um, and in fact, uh, in, in bounding sex here, uh, I, mean, mobile, I mean, almost all of them, uh, actually, uh, they actually converge to this definition. Uh, this is what we call the classical angular momentum. And it was at first written down by uh, Dre uh, and uh, in the 1980s. But I think it, actually, it was actually known before. Um, but it's identified in the following way. Okay? As I mentioned, uh, what we must involve this, uh, uh, this, uh, <coughs> uh, this uh, angular momentum aspect, this is an idea. And whenever you talk about uh, angular momentum, uh, you need to have a rotation heating field uh, as two here. So you're measuring the angular momentum uh, with respect to this uh, heating vector field. And, um, <coughs> and then you have this, uh, this term here, okay? We go uh, CAB is, uh, is a shear, and then you take a covariant derivative and you, you multiply by the C here. 
Okay? And this will correspond to the angular momentum of u equal to u0. So, uh, yeah, u equal to u0 here. Okay? And we are actually situated uh, at, at a future null infinity. So this really corresponds to this part here. That is uh, so-called the like cut uh, by this uh, null hypersurface at future null infinity. So this is corresponding to u equal to uh, u0, and you define an angular momentum. So that corresponds to uh, this uh, retarding cut angular momentum. And this is actually, um, well, this is a, a definition that is actually uh, quite a, yeah, it's actually some, it's not some nice property. So first of all, you can actually define um, this angle moment. And you see that this definition here, we just have u is equal to u equal to a constant. But you can actually extend this definition uh, to any cross section, okay? So you can just take any uh, cross section here, it's u is equal to f of x, f is a function of this 2 You recall a future null infinity which is considered as an x2. Uh, cross R here, so you can consider uh, the graph of, uh, of a cross section that will respond to this. And then uh, you can define the dress tuple, also define the angular momentum of this uh, particular cross section with respect to its kinetic field here. And they just define it in the following way. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's actually the relation between these two angular momentum, and they are actually related to this kind of uh, walking field. Okay. So you still have this NAB here to by by a null infinity, and this corresponds to the lead derivative of this uh, CAB here. And uh, this R here is actually this three-dimensional region here. That is between uh, this U equal to uh, F of X and U equal to U zero. So this is how you actually define uh, the angular momentum of, uh, of, uh, of uh, a general cross-section. And uh, this has a nice property. So, for example, when there's no news, no radiation, so NAB is equal to zero, and then you can see that this term just vanished. Okay? Um, and um, and what, then they just have the uh, angle moment and right to the same. So, when there's no radiation, um, I mean, the whole space up is, uh, is actually stationary. And in fact, you can see that if you uh, choose this y here to be a DDU here, and this will actually get, can actually relate to the uh, with the bonding uh, energy uh, loss form. So it's actually a uh, quite nice definition. However, um, this uh, uh, definition of uh, a trace triple, the classical angle momentum, and in fact, as well as uh, many previous definitions, uh, they do have a uh, uh, super translation. So what does that mean? Well, just like uh, what well, before I was talking about is energy, total energy flux. Now you can consider uh, the total angle moment so you look at uh, angular moment at u equal to um, infinity, uh, plus infinity, and, uh, and uh, angular moment at u equal to minus infinity. Let's see again. Um, this picture here, right? Um, so you start with uh, uh, you know, two black holes rotating, and then just merge into a single black hole. And as observer, we just look at uh, from future now infinity here. And now you can actually measure uh, the total flux of angular momentum. So this is u equal to uh, minus infinity, that's where you start, and then at the u equal to uh, plus infinity. So you take the difference of this angular momentum uh, definition initially and at the end. So that would be the total angular momentum flux. Yeah, okay, so this is a definition of uh, the total energy flux. Right? Uh, but it turns out uh, this uh, total angular momentum uh, flux here depends on the particular bonding sex in the system. Okay, so unlike the total energy flux uh, is independent of, uh, of the observer. In this case here, it really depends on the, uh, uh, the, uh, the coordinate system. And in fact, what we can prove is the following. As long as your, uh, your, um, your uh, total angular momentum flux is now zero, just give me any number that I can actually uh, create a new uh, on this x coordinate system through this super translation, such that the uh, angular momentum, total angular momentum plus, is this given number. Okay? 
So it, it really just depends on which uh, observer here. So for example, uh, Michael has an uh, observation, the Virgo has one here, and their answer uh, may not agree because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a coordinate dependent uh, point. So, uh, so in 1982, uh, Penrose uh, made the following statement. So uh, the very concept of angular momentum gets shifted by super translations. And it is hard to see uh, in these uh, circumstances how one can rigorously discuss such, content, uh, such questions as the angular momentum carry away uh, by gravitational radiation. So because of this uh, super translation ambiguity here, um, this concept of uh, angular momentum carried away by gravitational radiation, uh, what I've been uh, using uh, as total angular momentum flux, uh, it is actually not a, a well defined uh, uh, point. Okay, um, well, the way we resolve this ambiguity is actually we come up with a new definition of angular momentum. So, this is a new angular momentum. Uh, Definition um, uh, we have uh, by Colin uh, Chen and Taylor and uh, Yikai Wang, myself, and Professor Yao. And it really um, originated from a work that uh, uh, we, we've done uh, actually back in 2009. So that was actually 15 years ago. So we developed a whole theory about uh, positive local mass. And then uh, in 2015, um, with uh, Colin Chen, uh, we developed a theory of uh, quasi local angular momentum. So what does that mean? Um, it means that, um, well, in, in well, gravitation, okay, so unlike any other physical theory, um, is unique in the sense that it doesn't have any density. And this is actually due to uh, uh, Einstein's equivalence principle. You, you, uh, <clears throat> and so the best you can do uh, is, uh, if you want to measure uh, the, uh, the, uh, the energy uh, in a space-like region, and you could be just enclosed it by a two-dimensional surface. And you try to read out the information quasi log because you don't have a, a point wise density function to allow you to integrate. So, uh, so this theory is about well, given a surface um, in your space time that bounds uh, uh, some region in your space time here, you try to define the mass and you try to define the angular momentum in this region here. So, what we did is we actually uh, went back to the uh, Hamilton Jacobi analysis of the uh, Einstein. Uh, Hilbert functional, and we actually couple with uh, uh, with this theory, uh, mathematical theory of uh, isometric infinity. So this is about taking a surface here, and you take the induced Riemannian metric, and you try to embed it uh, in another uh, reference space, such that the induced metric in the reference space is the same as the uh, original uh, metric here. And the reason why we do that is uh, uh, in this hamilton jacobi analysis of uh, uh, definition of uh, energy here, you actually need to uh, have a reference term. Okay, you have the, and the reference term we took was just uh, an isometric embedding uh, in two the space space time. Okay, and we come up with a, a, a definition of uh, a quasi-local angular momentum uh, for a space time two surface in your space time, and you actually only depend on two geometric properties. So one is the induced metric. So we, we want to do, we, we need to do uh, isometric embedding. And the other uh, is, uh, is what is called a weak curvature vector. So this is actually a, uh, a, a, a section of the normal bundle, uh, basically. Uh, it's mean curvature, and it will actually give you a direction uh, in which um, you should perform if we want to uh, decrease the, the, the area of the surface uh, most efficiently. And it's also called uh, the null expansion uh, in general activity. Okay, so here we actually have a, a, a theory here um, that will actually give you um, the uh, <coughs> the, uh, uh, the angular momentum and the mass uh, on a two-dimensional surface. And in the case of uh, a bounding sex coordinate system, as I just mentioned, what we what we're interested in is uh, to define um, this uh, uh, mass or energy momentum. A future now infinity correspond to this here. Okay. But you recall this is actually infinity. So what we did is uh, we take our definition and the finite two dimensional surface, and then we push it along this uh, now hypersurface here, and then we obtain the definition uh, in now infinity. Okay. So it was actually on the finite two surface, but we push it all the way um, to infinity along this uh, now hypersurface here, 
and at the end we get uh, uh, a new definition of, uh, of angular momentum and now finished. Okay, um, so in a bounded sense coordinate on the u equal to u zero cut, we consider uh, the CWY uh, angular momentum on a two dimensional surface, R equal to R zero, and then R zero for the infinity. In turn, it was a very elaborate uh, calculation, uh, so you will start by uh, Jordan Keller, E pi one, and uh, Professor Yao. So the, the, the whole definition actually relied on not just isometric value, isometric value is already a uh, a, a, a ordinary linear elliptic equation, but we actually uh, come up with a so called optimal isometric bending equation. So, turn out when you do isometric bending into Nikowski uh, space, you actually have one functional degree of freedom. So, that will allow you to, uh, to define another equation. Okay, so, it's a, it's a very, very uh, long calculation, uh, but it was uh, finally done in 2019. And uh, it was actually kind of a, a, a surprise because, um, well, at first we thought it would just be a, a check uh, with uh, with a classical definition okay, to see if this limit here actually uh, coincides with a classical angular momentum. But somehow there's actually an additional term here. Okay, so this one here is a classical one struggle de definition that I just mentioned, but there's actually an additional term here. Okay. And that involves uh, this uh, function c here. Okay? So what is the c here? So c is again a function uh, on a two-dimensional sphere, but it depends on u. It always depends on u because we should consider it depend on a future dollar So it's a 10 uh, by the following. So this Laplace is really so this is a function depend on uh, the, the uh, two uh, on the two sphere that depend on u. But now you just take the, the Laplace operator on the two-dimensional sphere. So you have to solve this uh, uh, you have to solve this equation of plus 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 two is equal to the double divergence of C A B here. And you can check that this uh, uh, this solution is always solvable because the right hand side is the kernel of this uh, uh, elliptic operator. And um and but the kernel here is not going to affect this uh, this uh, solution here. But where where does this uh, uh this uh, this C come from? It it turns out this last term actually corresponds to the reference term. From the Hamilton Jacobi analysis. And C actually comes from solving uh, the optimal isometric uh, embedding equation. So this is somehow just correspond to the linearization of, uh, of this optimal isometric embedding equation, which is also a kind of equation. But now, you, well, once you're here, you can actually compare with other kind of quasi locals. And one of them is a, a well known uh, Brownian uh, quasi local mass. And uh, for the uh, Brownian quasi local mass, it actually involves the surface and involves the mean curvature of surface. But there's actually a reference term. And this reference term, again, is coming from a solving a, 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 a isometric embedding equation. So this is really the mean curvature of the uh, uh, reference isometric embedding into R3. So this term here uh, can really interpret it as a uh, reference term of this uh, uh, Brownian. And this is a theory that we proved uh, with this uh, this uh, this sort of uh, magic term here. Uh, you just have to assume a very mild assumption for the uh, the newest tensor. This really just uh, just guarantee uh, the total energy uh, flux uh, is actually integral. Uh, then we prove that this uh, this new angular momentum. Uh, if you look at this. Uh, uh, <clears throat> this total energy uh, flux, uh, then it's actually super translation error. Okay. Um, in fact, we can even take care of the case when uh, when there's an ordinary translation. So, you know, angular momentum will actually shift uh, even in uh, impossible cases. And, uh, and the transformation formula actually involves the angular momentum. Uh, well, if it is fully recovered, it's, uh, it's a covariance and variance of, uh, of uh, angular momentum. Okay, um, so this is uh, uh, the wealthy findings. So we are hoping to have a well-defined angle momentum that is independent of uh, observer. Uh, but I also mentioned that uh, we want to have a definition that is actually uh, stably defined. So it's actually um, you know, defined subject to any uh, perturbation. Okay. But uh, the thing about uh, this uh, CWY uh, angle momentum, originally when we compute uh, this CWY here, for uh, u equal to constant slice, 
Because the calculation is really, really complicated. So even this case is quite complicated. But uh, original way is only defined for this kind of size. But now since we already have super translation in Paris, so we can really define a general slice here uh, using this uh, uh, super translation uh, invariance property. So what it means is, uh, for example, uh, in this coordinate system, uh, if your slice is represented as uh, uh, u equal to f of x or, or a function on x2, then you can just do a super translation. So u bar is equal to u minus f of x. And then after the super translation, the original uh, slice here uh, become a level set of this uh, uh, u bar here. Uh, but we already know this uh, formula here, so we just define this to be equal to this. Okay, so this will this will actually extend the super translation invariance to uh, to uh, uh, to uh, general exceptions. But now we can we can ask about this uh, uh, this question of uh, whether uh, this is stably defined. Namely, um, well, suppose you have f of x, this function here on S two that is approaching a u zero really for the C zero. Then, um, that's the definition of uh, uh, angular momentum of this kind of general uh, cross section is converge to this uh, u equal to u zero here. And you can see that this kind of property uh, will be important, especially uh, when, when you really want to carry out the experiment. It has to uh, be able to accommodate any kind of uh, and um, and this uh, this. Uh, um, Trace tuple, the classical definition of angular momentum, it may satisfy uh, this uh, this property here, because you can see that the difference between these uh, they're given by this bulk integral here. Okay, so as so as this f of x is approaching uh, u zero uh, uniformly, so this section here is approaching this u zero uniformly, here, then this part here just vanishes. So you automatically satisfy this kind of uh, uh, this, this kind of uh, continuity property here. But our definition uh, is actually not obvious at all because it involves solving some uh, some elliptic equation. Uh, but we were able to prove this uh, uh, this cross section uh, continuity uh, through the cross section continuity of the uh, classical definition. Okay. Um, so this is what I just described how this is actually done. Um, so while we assume f of x is greater than zero. We assume this uh, uh, u zero is actually equal to zero here, okay. and we can actually relate the flux of uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, the new angular momentum and the uh, the classical one. Um, <clears throat> so we can actually relate this flux here. Okay. So uh, this is actually through a, a chain of uh, identities that I'm going to talk about it here. But the flux of this uh, C W one angular momentum uh, is actually equal to the flux of the um, the uh, uh, the classical angular momentum uh, plus an error term here. But this error term here, of course, is going to, uh, going to depend on this uh, still time. And um, in the second step, uh, we can actually apply the elliptic estimate uh, for the still time f here. And in particular, we show that the still time f uh, is actually less than equal to uh, c zero minus f here. And this is again, uh, when we think about it in retrospect, this is actually not uh, uh, expected uh, either. Because whenever we define this kind of uh, quasi local uh, quantity here, you always involve the metric and you always involve the optimal isometric value. In general, you will have to uh, require a much stronger uh, convergence, for example, in C3 normal uh, for the, the, the surface, in order to have the, uh, uh, the, the, the integral converge. But somehow, some, something actually match uh, happened uh, when you push up the null infinity here. Uh, yeah, this uh, uniform, uh, you know, I mean, this, uh, uh, yeah, you can actually achieve this, uh, uh, this, uh, this continuity of CS. Uh, uh, so this will actually finish on this, uh, uh, this part of state, uh, state related fine. Uh, so whenever you do a, even if you do a perturbation, uh, your, your, your angle moment and definition is still going to be the uh, controllable uh, everywhere. And this is only done um, for um, for body sense coordinates, but as I said, I mean, you, yeah, this, this body sense coordinate is where uh, this so-called BMS group uh, was discovered uh, back in the 1960s. But in the 1960s, uh, we actually didn't know much about the Einstein equation. They're actually only maybe countable of uh, 
global solution to so a pollution. But in the past few decades, uh, we, we know more about uh, uh, global solutions to so and they actually have different uh, different answer products uh, in different descriptions of, 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 uh, of non opinion for example, in this work of uh, crystal of climate. Um, but as I said, these are actually universal uh, issues. And, uh, uh, but it, it seems that, I mean, we, we, so we have tried different, uh, for example, uh, yeah, we, we try several more complicated situations. It seems that the, uh, our definition of uh, positive local legal movement uh, actually works. Uh, okay, but uh, this in this case here, uh, we can conclude that this, uh, uh, the idea movement that carry away by uh, fermentation and fusion can actually be stable at the time and without any uh, ambiguity. Okay, uh, so last slide. Uh, of course, uh, it's happy birthday in Professor uh, Yao. And um, I mean, I, while I emphasize the, uh, the data part, um, uh, uh, in fact, we, we, we were uh, planning uh, to have a conference, uh, 75 birthday uh, conference for Professor Yao uh, in Taiwan, and also uh, commemorate uh, his first visit to Taiwan. Almost 40 years ago, I think it was 1985. Um, so I'd like to uh, thank him uh, as, a, as a former student, as a collaborator, but also as a, as a mathematician uh, from Taiwan. I think we have uh, Ning Li here and the Chino Wang and the Chun Chun here. So thank you for, for his contribution to, uh, to Taiwan as a mathematician in the past uh, 40 years. Thank you.